A quiet afternoon in San Francisco in the spring of 1906. Electrified streetcars share boulevards with the first automobiles, a hint of coming changes in the new century. Almost overnight, suburbia was born. A half million homes sprang up around the country in 1946. Nearly a million in 1947, a million in 1948, still more in 1949, 1950. The empty farmlands, the quiet towns and villages surrounding the city found themselves in the midst of a roaring housing boom. This is the only part of the world at that time where, you know, plumbers and pipe fitters and sheetrock hangers could own their own home. The middle class is going to go basically from the wino level clear up to, you know, the doctors and the dentists. And everybody will be included. We'll have to depend on cars. Each year, there are more of them. Each year, there must be more highways and expressways to take care of them. Originally, the suburbs were places that developers actually paid for light rail systems and streetcars to go to in order to make the land viable, places to live. GM and Firestone and, and um, I think Standard Oil were actually convicted of conspiring to destroy the light rail systems across the United States. They literally bought them up and tore them out so that they could sell GM buses with Firestone wheels and run with uh, Standard Oil. Simultaneously, you had the Federal Highway Program. A Better Highways contest was recently conducted. The purpose? Arouse nationwide thinking on how to plan and pay for the safe and adequate highways we need. Highway experts wrote essays. I am privileged to present the winner of the Grand National Award, Robert Moses of New York. Highly, highly subsidized. So subsidized that to continue it, it is a deep question of whether we can afford to continue that level of subsidy, and it is unsustainable. The interstate highways have become continuous bands of suburban development. From, I mean, you could go from Maine to Florida on Interstate 95 and never see open countryside. It's become a continuous city. And the density of population in those areas is extremely low. It's not economic to build railroads or even bus lines are uneconomic in those vast areas of sprawl because population density is so low. The only uh, efficient way to travel is by individual automobile. Commuters who live in these outer suburban areas Every county within 50 miles of an interstate highway has shown population growth, and every county outside 50 miles of an interstate highway has declined. This is essentially completely going in the wrong direction. The suburbs wouldn't exist if it weren't for cheap oil. Um, the U.S. is a car culture. The automobile industry started in the U.S. And really, the automobile industry got, got its start here because we were looking for ways to use that cheap oil. The U.S. was awash in oil in the early 20th century. In the 1930s, they were discovering the stuff so fast that uh, oil in Texas was cheaper than drinking water by the car load. The car companies quickly became the engine-driving U.S. industry and economic growth. The result of this is that uh, we have created this new system of habitation where people live miles and miles from where they work and from where they get their food and all, the, all of their other necessities based on the idea that they can and they must hop in their car at any moment and, and travel miles and miles. And the only way that works is on the basis of, of cheap energy. Commuters praying for relief from awful traffic may one day see their spirits lifted in their cars, too. 
A Danish inventor has devised a monorail system that could be used by passenger vehicles and which could completely change the way we think about getting around. More from CNN technology correspondent Rick Lockridge. You might want to remember where you first saw this see-through electric car with a triangular slot up the middle. Because if Copenhagen inventor Pally Jensen is right, vehicles like this one will save our overcrowded cities from the traffic that's choking them and lift commuters from their daily despair. Would it be possible to make a system in between cars and train with advantages from the car world and advantages from the train world? So he designed the roof, R-U-F. In Danish, it means in a hurry. In English, it stands for rapid, urban, flexible. Roof cars and buses are just like any other battery-powered vehicles, except for that middle slot. That's what will enable them to ride the four-meter-high monorail where they will link up to form small trains. Once off the monorail, roofs can take you all the way to your destination. And that's important because Jensen believes many people will never use mass transit until it's as convenient for them as their personal cars. It takes into account the, the human nature. Uh, you don't want to be moved together with a lot of other people at a fixed timetable. Uh, you're more spontaneous. You suddenly have a need to be moved. And not only will roof move you, Jensen says the monorail will recharge your battery and give you a high-speed internet connection while you're riding on it. Transfers on and off the rail will be totally automated. Proposed roof buses will have individual doors for all 10 passengers and will drop off those passengers on rolling ramps like these so no one can get run over. If it seems like Pally Jensen has already thought of an answer to any question you might ask about safety, convenience, reliability, he has. I don't think there will be any problems with people accepting this on the contrary, they will have a beautiful view, and they will really enjoy the trip. On a chilly morning outside Copenhagen's main technical college, a prototype roof glides onto a steel I-beam, clasping it firmly between rubber wheels. Every component of the roof has been tested, and the project has a long list of corporate backers. But the one thing the roof system doesn't have yet is a city willing to commit about a billion dollars to build it. Several are considering the idea, including Copenhagen. We're following the tests and are fond of what we are seeing, but it's, it's a very big, it's a huge project if you have to uh, integrate it in the city of Cop like Copenhagen. The inventor says he dreams of installing the first rough monorail right here in Copenhagen. But he says if a Mexico City or a Seattle comes up with the money first, they'll be the first to get one. What's important, Jensen says, is that people embrace an entirely new way of getting around. One which combines the convenience of personal cars with the efficiencies of mass transit. It'll be good for the environment, he says, and also good for the soul. Get uh, to your work completely relaxed instead of coming stressed from the highway congestion. How many commuters would agree that's reason enough to raise the roof? For Science and Technology Week, I'm Rick Lockridge. I'm about to ride the fastest train on the continent. From the heart of the nation's capital, through the busiest passenger rail corridor in America. Fill up and hold on tight. I'm at the heart of the busiest passenger rail line in America, the Northeast Corridor. Stretching 440 miles from D.C. to Boston, this set of steel rails transports more passengers more often than any other rail line in the country. Amtrak does nearly half of all its nationwide business right here. That's more than 10 million passengers a year. Business people who live in this fast-paced environment don't have time to wait around. Luckily, they don't have to wait because the Northeast Corridor also features America's only high-speed rail service. Amtrak's Acela Express. A lightning-fast, European-style bullet train linking this country's biggest cities. This bullet train zooms from downtown to downtown up to 150 miles an hour. Since 2000, the Acela Express has zipped up and down the East Coast, serving America's most densely populated seaboard. And today, it's going to take me home. And Union Station sits right in the heart of the city. It takes six hours and 43 minutes to get from Washington to Boston on the Acela. I'll start out in the nation's capital, Washington, D.C., before whizzing northbound for the bright lights of New York City. Then it's on to South Station in Boston, my final destination. 
crew is getting our train ready at the Ivy City here in Washington. And I'm gonna see what a high-speed facility is all about. This place only services the unique Acela train. Since each Acela train costs 25 million a piece, there's only 20 in existence. Even with just 20 trains, Amtrak still manages 35 Acela routes a day. The Acela Express operates at full capacity all the time. It's important people with important things to do. So when a train reaches the Ivy City high-speed facility, Amtrak has to service it, turn it around, and get it back out on the rails. There's no turn around here. These trains have to be in and right back out pronto. Two dozen craftsmen have less than four hours to inspect every inch of this train. And it all has to check out fine. Unlike a freight train or a normal passenger train, the Acela cannot be taken apart. This is called a train set. Between each coach is a semi-permanent coupler. It's right in there. It gives the train a very, very tight connection. The tight connection of the train set eliminates the pulling and lurching found in trains with separate cars. The smoother ride allows Acela passengers to work away on their laptops without interruption. But having all the cars connected does have its downside. Because it's kept in one piece, cars can't be broken off for service. If one car has a problem, the entire train has to be pulled with it. Each train set is made up of four business class cars, a cafe car, and a first class car. It's going to take a little extra muscle to get up to 150 miles per hour, so the Acela needs some extra power. The Acela's unique engines aren't known as locomotives. They're called power cars. While standard diesel locomotives can generate over 4,000 horsepower, these power cars generate 6,000 horsepower. This has more horsepower than any other train in America. And our train has two, one at either end, which makes it easier and quicker to turn trains around and stay on schedule. So how does this power car get enough juice to turn out 6,000 horsepower? It all starts from above. Heavy-duty wires called catenaries carry electricity 16 feet above the rails. To get that electricity into our train, a conductive metal bar called a pantograph is connected to the roof of the power cars. When the wire's alive, electricity flows down through the pantograph and into our engines. A bad connection equals zero power. So Washington, D.C.'s Union Station is the gateway to the nation's capital. Opened in 1908, the station became an integral part of American life during the two world wars, transporting nearly 200,000 troops, politicians, and passengers a day. This is one of the greatest rail stations in American history. Today, Washington's Union Station is visited by 32 million people each year and serves as the southernmost end of the Northeast Corridor. From businessmen to tourists to students to your average Joe to politicians, over 90,000 people come through this station every day. And with air travel getting more expensive and less reliable, this high-speed Acela train is in demand for its on-time service. This 150-mile-an-hour land jet is about to take off. Let's go. The 10 a.m. high-speed Acela train is racing full throttle to Boston, Massachusetts. I'm used to riding freight trains back in Maine. The Acela is from a different planet. You can feel the acceleration. It's, like, it's a lot like flying. If you've ever flown in a plane and taken off, it, this is the feeling I'm having right now in my seat. <laughs> this is crazy. A high-speed train is defined as any train that travels over 124 miles per hour. On some stretches, the Acela Express gets up to 150 miles per hour. So it definitely qualifies as a high-speed train. Wow, this is great. This is insane. I'm so, we're going 95 miles an hour right now. Like, within 10 seconds, it's like, boom, 95 miles an hour, 96. This is fantastic. Oh my God. 118 miles an hour. 
134 miles an hour. To keep people and vehicles out of harm's way, Amtrak minimizes crossings along the Acela route. This is the fastest train in North America. What's even more impressive to me is how fast it slows down. It's not only the fastest train in the country as far as speed, but it's also the fastest braking train. The Acela uses an electric dynamic braking system to ensure a safe, smooth, and speedy stop. So we're in Baltimore now. Yes, sir. We're going to stop and pick some people up and drop some people off. When the electric brakes are activated, electricity is withdrawn from the train's traction motors, reversing their direction and slowing the train down. They take but electric brakes are also energy efficient. When the traction motors are reversed, the electric power is returned through the pantograph back into the catenaries to be used by other trains. We're taking that ability to dynamic brake and we're putting electricity back into the overhead wire. Electric power is only one part of what allows this Acela to get up to 150 miles per hour. When a train goes into a curve, an inward force called centripetal force pushes towards the center of the curve and sends the train round. Just like when a biker leans inward when taking a corner. The problem for most trains is that they can't lean, so they have to slow down instead. But the Acela is no regular train. It can tilt. The train's ability to tilt around curves is a major ingredient in this high-speed cocktail. And there's the tilt. We're going around this curve cars behind us are tilting. Once the train gets above 60 miles per hour, the tilt system kicks in, and the cars lean into the curves, allowing the Acela to keep going without slowing down. Here's how it works. Each car has a tilt control center. This is where they hook the laptop up to check and calibrate the tilt of the train. Oh, and we're tilting, we're tilting. Wow. When this train's moving, though, you would never notice a thing. But right now, we're stationary. You can really feel the rock. The tilt system on the power car gets information from a gyroscope at the front of the train. This tells each car's individual tilt mechanism what angle to tilt at. And just like on a racetrack, the train leans into the curves. As you can see right here, there are hydraulic cylinders underneath the train that make it tilt. Because of the advanced tilt control, no one will ever spill a drink on this train. For the passengers sitting down, it's a smooth and comfortable ride. Even though the passengers don't notice these curves, the engineer is aware of every inch of these tracks. But you still had to slow down for this curve here. We went from. Was 110, it, we're 105, 110 yeah. to 105 for this curve, but still with this train, it's only a five mile an hour difference where a regional train would have to slow down. Means the engineer needs to have skill and an understanding of the tilt mechanism. We're approaching the city of brotherly love, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. 30th Street Station. Coming into a place like this with the electric, with the electric power units is a lot different than diesel too, where there's no fumes. Right. This is another place where the electric engines really help out. And there are a lot of people here getting ready to get on this train. So from here, we're about an hour from New York? 55 minutes to an hour, yes. Wow. Amtrak's other major obstacle to full-on high-speed running comes from below, the rails themselves. It's hard to believe, but much of the track system on the Northeast Corridor dates back to the 1800s. And though sturdy, it's not high-speed ready. Between Washington, D.C. and Boston, there are over 300 speed changes. It's up and down all the way. There's one way to make this stretch ready for a high-speed train, concrete ties. In 1997, Amtrak began to replace wooden ties along the Northeast Corridor with sturdier, steel-reinforced concrete ones. Because the one hard and fast rule for high-speed routes is that sturdier tracks equal faster trains. Now we're about to take the plunge. This tunnel goes under the Hudson River and into the Big Apple. Next stop, New York, under the Hudson into Penn Station. This tunnel, known as the North River Tunnel, opened in 1910. Today, it operates at almost 100% capacity during peak hours. And while the tunnel has seen thousands of trains in its lifetime, it's never seen anything as fast as the Acela. 
We're under the Hudson River right now. How far does this tunnel go? It's roughly three miles long. Wow, three miles under the Hudson River. And this tunnel is tight. Barely enough room for us to fit through here. I don't know what we're going to do when a train comes the other way. <laughs> I can see the light at the end of the tunnel here. And when we come out, we're going to be in New York City, the Big Apple. Back in 1902, all the trains traveling through New York City were powered by steam locomotives. In the Since 1920, all trains on the Northeast Corridor have run on electricity. We're making good time, but New York's Penn Station is the busiest in America. With 600,000 people passing through each day, New York's Penn Station sees more passenger traffic in 24 hours than all three of New York's airports combined see in one year. We've only got five minutes to get everybody on and off this train. When you're running the fastest train on the continent, every second counts. The timer starts now. Until we can move a ton of goods using no fuel, we've got the next best thing. CSX trains can move a ton of goods 423 miles on one gallon of fuel. See ya. I'm day and night. I'm in New York's Penn Station, the busiest train station in America. Amtrak alone serves 8 million people a year here. The original Penn Station was the jewel in the Pennsylvania Railroad's crown. In 1910, the Pennsylvania Railroad began regular train service in and out of Penn Station. The original pink granite structure took up two city blocks and covered eight acres. To build it cost the equivalent of $2.5 billion in today's money. Its main waiting room was the largest indoor space in New York. During World War II, passenger numbers soared, but by the late 1950s, airplanes began to replace rail travel. Today, just the lower levels of Penn Station exist, but they still see more traffic than any other station in America. Of the 1,365 trains that run through here every weekday, 35 of them are the cream of the crop. That's the Acela. Amtrak needs to juggle hundreds of trains at a time and keep them on schedule. Amtrak controls all the trains in the region right here. Yep. For the Acela, every minute counts, so they have priority over every train on that board. If you look at the tracks that are green, that means there's a route cleared for the train that's coming. Behind it, the track turns red. That means the system's not going to let any other trains in there. Every 90 seconds, 1,000 passengers go through Penn Station. It's a precision job keeping all of these trains moving. Right here are the train dispatchers. It's their job to control every train on the Northeast Corridor. That board represents 98.6 miles of track leading in and out of Penn Station. There are 11 platforms and 21 tracks in Penn Station. If someone down there makes a mistake, it's going to be a train crash. It's going to be a tragedy. And it never happens on the Northeast Corridor. And there's so many trains, so you know these guys are down here doing their job. The tracks inside Penn Station are among the most heavily trafficked in the world. So Amtrak constantly needs to replace them. 150 miles an hour is the fastest speed any land vehicle is allowed in North America. High-speed trains like the Acela are often called bullet trains because of their sleek aerodynamic design. And it all starts up front. The Acela's power car consists of a single lightweight shell, making this Acela lighter and faster than other trains. Though the Acela is America's fastest train, it's not the fastest train in the world. In Europe, high-speed bullet trains like France's TGV run at speeds up to 190 miles per hour. The Shinkansen in Japan rockets up to 218 miles per hour. 
And in 2003, the Maglev recorded the fastest speed in history, maxing out at a heart-stopping 361 miles per hour. Though our top speed is 150 miles per hour, this Acela train could go faster. These power cars could go up to 200 miles an hour if they were allowed. But the combination of heavy traffic along the line and out-of-date tracks and wires hold the train back. Until Amtrak is able to build a dedicated line, this is probably the fastest any train is going to be able to go in the United States. In other countries, overwhelming demand paved the way for high-speed rail. Today, a high-speed rail network in the U.S. seems far off, but the possibilities are breathtaking. The fastest trains in the world can safely get up to 300 miles per hour. At that speed, you'd be able to get from New York to Los Angeles by train in only 10 hours. Getting from Chicago to Houston would take less than four hours. And this Acela train could blast nonstop from Washington to Boston in under two hours. In such a world, rail could surpass air travel in both popularity and efficiency because of its enormous passenger capacity and its direct access to city centers. What's better than blasting by a beach on a nice sunny day like today? This is beautiful. It is unsustainable. The interstate highways have become continuous bands of suburban development. From, I mean, you could go from Maine to Florida on Interstate 95 and never see open countryside. It's become a continuous city. And the density of population in those areas is extremely low. It's not economic to build railroads or even bus lines are uneconomic in those vast areas of sprawl because population density is so low. The only uh, uh, efficient way to travel is by individual automobile. Commuters who live in these outer suburban areas, every county within 50 miles of an interstate highway has... A quiet afternoon in San Francisco in the spring of 1906. Electrified streetcars share boulevards with the first automobiles, a hint of coming changes in the new century. Almost overnight, suburbia was born. A half million homes sprang up around the country in 1946. Nearly a million in 1947. A million in 1948. Still more in 1949, 1950. The empty farmlands, the quiet towns and villages surrounding the city found themselves in the midst of a roaring housing boom. This is the only part of the world at that time where, you know, plumbers and pipe fitters and sheetrock hangers could own their own home. The middle class is going to go shown population growth and every county outside 50 miles of an interstate highway has declined. This is essentially completely going in the wrong direction. The suburbs wouldn't exist if it weren't for cheap oil. Um, the U.S. is a car culture. The automobile industry started in the U.S. And really, the automobile industry got, got its start here because we were looking for ways to use that cheap oil. The U.S. was awash in oil in the early 20th century. In the 1930s, they were discovering the stuff so fast that uh, oil in Texas was cheaper than drinking water by the carload. The car companies quickly became the engine driving U.S. industry and economics. Basically from the wino level clear up to, you know, the doctors and the dentists. And everybody will be included. We'll have to depend on cars. Each year there are more of them. Each year there must be more highways and expressways to take care of them. Originally the suburbs were places that developers actually paid for light rail systems and streetcars to go to in order to make the land viable, places to live. GM and Firestone and, and um, I think Standard Oil were actually convicted of conspiring to destroy the light rail systems across the United States. They literally bought them up and tore them out so that they could sell GM buses with Firestone wheels run with uh, Standard Oil. 
simultaneously you had the federal highway program. A Better Highways contest was recently conducted. Purpose? Arouse nationwide thinking on how to plan and pay for the safe and adequate highways we need. Highway experts wrote essays. I am privileged to present the winner of the Grand National Award, Robert Moses of New York. Highly, highly subsidized. So subsidized that to continue it, it is a deep question whether we can afford to continue that level of subsidy. And